I'll start. I thank everyone for joining us for the Innovate Bio Fall 2020 webinar series. We are super excited to have um, an ATE project to be sharing with you all today. You know, part of the center's you know responsibility is to make sure that we're engaging with all of the ATE biotech projects. And one of the ways that we can do that is through hosting um, webinars that highlight those projects. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jason and Justin who are going to um, fill you in on their project and the work that they've been doing. Um, hi, I'm Justin Tickhill. Uh, I'm the PI on this project of the Bioscience Expansion Graph. Boy, oh boy. The Bioscience Expansion Project. Uh, I apologize, I've been on Zoom since 10 a.m. So sometimes your tongue just decides that that's enough. Um, uh, I am an associate professor at North Central State College. I am now the biology program coordinator um, and the chair of the assessment committee. Um, and I am the PI on this grant. So uh, Jason, go for it. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jason Tucker. I'm the co-PI on this ATE project. I'm also the program coordinator of our bioscience program here at NC State. And I'm also our division representative on our internal quality matters committee, which came about by the project and then really kind of expanded what Justin and I have been able to do these last few months that hopefully we'll be able to share with you over the next few minutes. So to start off, because um, not necessarily everyone was able to attend the PI conference, um, we're going to run the breakdown of our program. There was a, 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 an ask that we have a 90 second video that described our program. So I'm gonna play that for you now. The Bioscience Technician Expansion Project is a new to ATE grant that was awarded to North Central State College in Mansfield, Ohio. The proposal outlined the conversion of courses from an all-in-person modality to a hybrid format. The grant was designed to provide a pathway for students from a career center through our community college and on to a four-year university partner to establish a stronger workforce in North Central Ohio's biotechnology community. Our grant has worked closely with our primary community partner, Charles River Laboratories, in developing our evening timeframes and providing qualified adjunct faculty to facilitate student learning in this new format. The grant provided significant opportunities for professional development to the faculty involved. During the transition to an online format in March of 2020, the skills developed by the grant personnel would prove invaluable in the new online modality. I was able to be a resource for our large volume science courses, our biology for majors course, our anatomy and physiology series. The expertise I gained directly benefited the 150 students I had that semester, the 20 students I had over the summer, and the 200 students that I'm teaching this semester. So through the grant, I gained experience where I was able to review and consult on 36 additional courses within our health sciences division. In addition, I've been able to convert the rest of the bioscience curriculum to the online hybrid format, and I'll be continuing to provide support for an additional 13 courses in the health sciences division. This grant has provided North Central State College a new pathway for technician education in the growing field of biotechnology. So, thank you. Um, with that, there we go. Um, so, we're going to talk about the uh, expansion um, and how how we went about it and what we've changed as as we've gone through from the hybrid format to the online for format, but what the hybrid format really taught us. Now, the other important part of this is that we're planning on this being an interactive webinar uh, where, where you are welcome to ask questions. In fact, we're going to greatly encourage it. Now, the one thing that I would ask you to do is um, in chat, um, and I had that on the, the first slide, but in chat, just go ahead and say, you know, raise hand or have a question, or if you have the, um, the reaction that is raise hand um, that should work, but realize that there are quite a few people in the webinar and so we might not necessarily be able to see you raise your hand. Um, so that's why I say um, put it in chat because then you don't necessarily write out your question. Just say question. Uh, and that'll let us respond fast enough that we can actually um, hear you out because that's what we're here for. So 
the original concept of the grant, um, we're looking to assist the local workforce because we have a critical technician shortage. Um, we've got roughly 300 jobs sitting open um, that, that we need to fill. Uh, so these are that associate degree level job um, and we don't have the students um, that they could fill those spots. So we were looking to allow for additional cohorts of students. One of our difficulties was that we were trapped during a day cohort where we were mostly focused on students that were uh, enrolled in high school programs and, was, and were coming to us. Um, and then um, some of those times, those students would instead use it more as a transfer degree. So there were three main things uh, that the grant, uh, three main components to the grant, I'm sorry. Uh, the hybrid course content via one night, one class model. Now I'm gonna come back and talk about this one night, one class idea um, in a few minutes, um, but I will make those materials accessible once the grant is um, completed or in the same sense, um, if you're really at a challenge right now and, and you do need support, um, we are more than happy to help support, um, support you. We just wanted it to be as nice as possible. Uh, also, building collaborations with no, local and national community partners. Um, we need better identification for students who need to come back. Um, so people who are already in the workforce who want to return, um, but also in really encouraging our local population and, and helping our local population understand that biotechnology is a job it is a good job. It is a job you want. Um, and our community partner, Charles River Laboratories, has been a great, great asset during this whole process. We really do appreciate that. Um, and promote, and promote workforce uh, sustainability. I'm sorry, like I said, I've been in quite a few Zooms this morning. Uh, by targeting those career and high school students and bringing in prospective students into the program, both from those early levels, but also returning adults um, to help make sure that our workforce actually meets the demands that we have. So the one course, one night model um, was one of those Justin ideas um, as they start out. Uh, what if I could make it so that each course was just a one-stop shop when somebody's working for a living they have a very limited time frame in where they and when they can do things. Uh, so allowing the lecture materials to be either predominantly or entirely online and then working with the labs in person uh, to bring them in one night a week and making all of their assignments as, as we'll see that dedicated statement of when things are due um, becomes really critical later on. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't understood at the beginning of this. It just seemed that it would be a pleasant side effect. It would make it simpler for the students, but we'll, we'll find that that deliberate mindset really became critical as we move forward. Uh, but the other nice part of the one course one night is it would allow students to piece, piece together a degree program if they were working in a pretty intense area, which um, biotechnology and, and the number of the amount of overtime, the number of hours that people are working when they work at that particular partner, um, it's pretty high. Uh, so being able to sometimes branch out or pace out uh, these courses to be able to work through them at a slower pace um, in some cases, or at the normal to your pace. Oh, we have a question. No? Okay, sorry. Um, so the course, uh, the programs in the, the course of study that we decided to uh, change to hybrid format are general biology one or biology for majors one. Um, how we actually term it at our college is biology one, but I, I tend to term it three different ways because every college seems to have a different name for the exact same course. Uh, but once we once I say it this way, um, everybody knows, oh, I know which course you mean. Um, so the two part biology intro series, um, introduction to lab techniques, um, environmental science, agricultural science, and then Jason was right in the middle of converting histology as the, the COVID difficulties became apparent. 
Um, so the grant put us in a very strong position for our college and benefited our college by giving us the expertise to support the students building for all of our health science degree programs um, and initial scaffolding in these early courses, these, these general biology courses or um, the other courses I teach are the anatomy and physiology series uh, and building a solid direct scaffolding that led to this online environment. So they weren't surprised by it. So it wasn't different, um, even though it was different. Um, now you'll note that the number of courses that Mr. Tucker has uh, consulted on has grown significantly since the earlier video. Uh, and I am going to let him take that away in a moment. I'm actually gonna jump down to consulting and supporting the local high schools um, because that was one that I, I was more on point with. Uh, we've been working with local high school instructors on how they deliver distance science courses um, and helping them understand how we do that um, and getting feedback from them on, on what they need and how they can better provide this information for their students. Um, and that was something that was, uh, those skills I were not skills I would have had without the grant. Um, so I'll let Jason take it away. Okay, so what I wanna share and well, the way Justin and I have split up today's talk is, I'm gonna kind of identify how our college normally looks at courses and prepares them for distance learning. And then when COVID craziness took over, how we modified that. And then I'm going to give some just tidbits of advice on what I did specifically for the bioscience program. My discussions are going to be more traditional um, pedagogy in nature. And then Justin's going to hop back on and talk a lot about the creative labs that he designed because they were just super creative. But as Justin shared, this experience through the grant, he's able to take this creativity, apply it to these learning objectives so students could actually get some hands-on experience on DNA extraction, on other, you know, advanced physiology type concepts that normally they do in their A&P labs, but COVID dictates we have to do it online. So what I want to share for this first little bit, I don't want to go too much into this because again, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for your questions and then for Justin kind of to show off as I told him to a little bit later, is that normally before COVID craziness, our college, North Central State College here in Mansfield has a quality matters committee. And this is an internal committee that oversees the development of distant learning courses. We utilize the QM standards rubrics that you can go onto the quality matters website and just for the sake of time, didn't want to dive into those because that's more quality matters workshops and training and that's not the purpose of today's discussions, but they have a series of standards that go in and just look at accessibility for students. Do you have the learning objectives identified? How are you assessing those learning objectives? How are you providing student feedback? And just what's your overall layout of your course and your particular learning, learning management system of choice here on campus, we utilize Canvas. So typically pre-COVID, a developer, a faculty expert would take the course through about a two and a half month, I call it a workshop, that they would basically be enrolled in a Canvas course. Again, we utilize Canvas here. And they would just submit something once a week on their course. It might be, okay, what's your course syllabus? What's your first learning objective? How are you assessing it? Have you looked at accessibility concerns for your students? You know, are you getting accessibility statements? from any third party vendors. And just the purpose of it was, one, not to make it too cumbersome on faculty, because this is all full-time faculty teaching, you know, developing these on top of full-time schedule, but allowed the committee and our instructional designer on campus to provide direct feedback before that faculty person, as I call it, jumps down the rabbit hole of fully fleshing out that course in Canvas. And then what we would do is, you know, in addition looking at learning objectives and everything else identified, the committee would then meet with that developer and they just share the course. And we would, we did Zoom before it was cool, but we would look at the course and basically those of us on the committee would try to break the course. You know, look at it with a fresh set of eyes. If I'm a new student, and I've never been in, on campus before, can I find the course syllabus? Can I find my assignments? Why am I doing this assignment? When is it due? 
and just providing that direct feedback um, that is in a practical nature, in addition to like, what's the purpose of this assignment? How are you assessing this learning objective? You know, are your points allocations correct? Or maybe you have too many points allocated that are kind of gimme points. But it was a very fruitful discussion. Um, if I jump back a couple of slides here, um, Justin developed both the general biology courses, and then I took through the three bioscience courses. And then, as he mentioned, I was in the middle of developing our histology course when the month of March hit. I think we have a question. Um, Jason, I had a question about the makeup of the committee. Is it entirely a faculty committee? Because we use QM here. And, mm -hmm. and anyone developing an online course um, has to go through the training. Anyone teaching an online course has to go through the training. But I, I'm curious about the committee because um, our faculty are pretty much working in isolation. Mm -hmm. Once they're you know developing, it, it would be kind of cool to have more faculty input. Yeah. So our committee here on campus, we have one representative, faculty representative from each of our divisions. Spoiler alert, I became the health sciences one last fall because of the grant. So we have our three faculty members that have experience with distance learning in addition to our on-campus instructional designer. And he has a full, he reviews courses for the Ohio Quality Matters group. Um, to serve on the committee, I had to go through the APPQMR, I feel like I'm botching that, that single day workshop. Um, there are other workshops I'm looking to do. Might share about that a little bit later at the end of the presentation. Oh, I, and, I'd be interested in that. Like I said, that's the workshop that all of our faculty that have anything to do with online courses must do mm -hmm. before they can develop or teach. Yeah. We okay. now have, we used to have to do it through QM, mm -hmm. but um, we now have the ability to offer it on our campus. Awesome. Um, uh, they're even letting us doing do it virtually um, during COVID. That's fantastic. Anyway, um, sorry. no, you're good. We lucked out. Um, Ashland University, one of our um, <clears throat> partners, you know, four university partners in the area, they their Quality Matters group. One of their um, designers is certified to do these QM workshops. So I lucked out. I just traveled down to their nursing school where they're happening to do it, which was ten minutes down the road for me, and it was a one day workshop. Now we have, uh, I'll just briefly share, we've had internal discussions within our committee and then with some folks in administration about doing just that, Deborah, like you're talking about, for lack of a better term, making faculty um, go through that type of workshop, but there's been some resistance from multiple sides. And of course with COVID, that's all kind of, kind of gone to the wayside a little bit just because we're all trying to, um, I don't want to say survive, but that is something we have on our schedule for in the spring um, to kind of revisit because this process, this would not give you the QM seal of approval um, that you have to go through the external group, but we wanted to have a committee that guides faculty that if they, you know, it's not just develop a course online, throw PowerPoints, throw a couple quizzes and call that good. We want to make sure students are going to be successful regardless of what modality that they take the course in. Good question. Um, and as you can see there at the bottom, our committee can normally review about four or five courses a semester with you know just the weekly checks that they do with our instructional designer. And then when the course gets released to us committee members, you know, we'll spend multiple hours, you know, break trying to break the course. You know, you say you use this third party vendor, where's your accessibility statement? Because if somebody's colorblind, or if they have other disabilities, you know, they may not be as successful and that's, that's a problem. So those are just things we try to head off before the course gets fully ramped up and then obviously before it gets released to students. Now, as I mentioned, um, Justin and I started converting courses very early in the grant. I'm proud to say we actually started the process the semester we found out we got the grant. Um, he took the first general biology course through, I took biology or bioscience 1010 and we're in the middle of taking that first course through when we got the lovely award letter from the NSF and so our work continued and then Justin took the second gen bio course I started to take additional bioscience courses and then over the summer of 2019 our former um, division representative retired 
she had reached that magic, magic number and retired. And so our committee spot came open and I volunteered for it because of the experience with the grant. I'd taken three courses through. I knew one more was gonna come um, with histology. And so what I jumped in and what I loved about it is whenever I took courses through, having the ability in those Zoom reviews, because it was kind of scary, I'll admit, especially, you know, it was my second semester teaching and I came straight from industry. I joke with people, I didn't know what the word pedagogy meant when I stepped on this campus. And those Zoom reviews with our instructional designer and other experienced faculty just acting as mentors, you know, I wanted to be in that atmosphere and just I wanted to work with them more and just pick their brains more. So I jumped on the committee and just allowed me to look at courses from other divisions, you know, look at an engineering course, look at a data analytics course from our business program. So working with those faculty, seeing how they're doing things, if they're using modules, if they're using assignments, and then thinking, how can I incorporate their successes into the bioscience program? And it was fantastic last fall. Last spring, we were, I was taking histology. There were a couple other courses. The Thursday before spring break, when we thought COVID might be a bit of a concern, um, we had a quick faculty meeting on how to use Zoom and the off chance we needed to go online for like a week. Hopefully you catch the sarcasm because I think it was four days later. Yeah, we're in the situation that we are now. And so one of the big things that I did in the spring, and then we'll get into what I did for the courses, is you know being on this committee and when this shutdown occurred, you know Justin and I kind of looked at each other like, okay, this is not going to be pleasant. But through taking courses through and Justin having delivered a course um, in this format already, we both knew what we needed to do, and we had multiple tools in our toolboxes to do it. It was just time was our enemy. I mean, obviously, you know, we extended our spring break two days, and you know, I shared with our students after they were notified by the college what was happening. I said, here's my plan. By the way, the reason why we're having an extended spring break is because of this. Just drink some caffeine for me now because I'm going to need it. And students kind of chuckled at it. But I was like, I'm not kidding. Please drink caffeine on my behalf. And one of the tasks that I helped with in March and especially in April was the college quickly realized online is not going anywhere. And regardless if a faculty person intentionally designed a course to go online, like Justin and I had done, we got to get students to graduate, but we have to make sure we're assessing those learning objective, objectives to the same rigor. Because again, sure, we could push students out the door, like, you know, nursing students per se, but they're kind of important right now. You know, share a floor with our respiratory therapy faculty. We don't want to just say, all right, here's your grade, get out of here, because that's that could be very dangerous to those uh, patients. So we worked with faculty like, look, this isn't ideal, but how can you creatively assess critical lab techniques or other components in the online realm? And one of the things we had to do is, well, the two and a half month workshop's gone because nobody's got time for that. So we shrank that two and a half month workshop into a single submission of course material. We asked faculty to submit their learning objectives and their assessment strategies, um, their course syllabus. And then we also had that single Zoom review of that course as a first, we asked for the first four weeks of the course to be set up in Canvas. So we shrank a two and a half month workshop where normally faculty you know, chose to go through this. You know, They felt that the course they were taking through would be excellent in this format. Don't care if you like it or not. We got to make sure students are successful. We got to make sure we meet those learning objectives. So we shrank a two and a half month workshop into basically one Zoom meeting. And that includes the review of those courses by the members on the committee. So as we get going again, I'm going to share a little bit, I'm going to check time here, on what I did specifically for the bioscience program. And then Justin's going to share what he's done for a lot of labs. And then I'll kind of Come back on at the end but again please uh we want to make sure we have time at the end for you folks to share your innovative techniques that you've done because as our grant evaluator jim Hyder shared with us over the summer this really covid really provided a disruptive innovation opportunity at least for us with the grant but i think we can all appreciate that because 
it's been all types of fun these last eight plus months, but the creativity we as faculty have had to come up with, you know, being flexible with students going in and out of quarantine or testing positive for COVID. You know, we've all, I felt grown a lot as faculty and there's as you know, human beings as well, being so compassionate for our students. So it's been very interesting. Do I want to go through this again? Probably not, but it is what it is. So when our college started to quote unquote, shut things down, which we all vividly remember, um, I'm never going to forget our spring break. Um, our students were notified, obviously, by the college, but something else I wanted to do because in the middle of spring break, as things were starting to occur, I was getting those frantic emails, especially for my second years that were looking to graduate in under two months. Does this impact our practicum? Are we going to have to take an incomplete? Can I still graduate? What I did was I, one night, I think it was the Thursday night, late, I typed up a letter to all my bioscience students and said, Here's what the college is planning. Here's what I'm looking to do as your instructor and either if they were taking me in the bioscience program or if they're taking an adjunct. I wanted to touch base with every student and I made sure they all got back with me, one, to make sure they were okay, but also just to make sure, okay, technology wise, are you good? Because originally the plan was to go virtual for two weeks with everything. We all planned it's going to be the rest of the semester, which it obviously has been. So what we did do is we pulled my practicum students from their external laboratory sites. Um, I specifically, again, as Justin shared, want to be grateful to Charles River Laboratories. Um, what they did in the middle of March, they had already sent all their other internship students out of the facility. They purposely kept my bioscience students an extra week to get them additional experience. I cannot stress enough how grateful I am for that. Eventually, the college did mandate. I had to pull them out. We did it with everybody, all our clinical sites, nursing students, respiratory therapy students. So I did have to say, all right, time's come. We got to get them out. But they allowed my students to work an extra three or four days, which I am beyond grateful for. Um, so getting more like pedagogy wise, I utilize simulations and virtual lectures to emphasize those remaining learning objectives. And again, this was not ideal. And this is what I shared with folks as I started to work with them with the QM committee is like, look, I understand you don't like this transition. It is what it is, but we've got to make sure we hit these learning objectives. Because again, these nursing students, respiratory therapy students, my bioscience students that some went straight on the Charles River after graduating and basically picked up where they left off with their practicum work. We've got to make sure they've got the skills and knowledge necessary to be successful. So that was where the creativity really came to play. And again, Justin's going to share some goodies that he's done in his courses here in a little bit. So in addition to trying to keep my second year sane, first years were pretty resilient. Um, I remained in this consultant role with the QM committee throughout the summer and the fall. And we realized COVID wasn't going anywhere. So we we're makeshifting what we were doing for the spring. Summer, we realized every single course at the college that's not been through the QM process needs to go through this modified format. And suddenly going from four to five courses a semester, now we're looking at, I think we had to do collectively 60 courses for the summer term. And we had to do that while the spring semester was still going on. This is where my life got really fun back in April. So we asked folks that were teaching summer courses, um, Justin took one of the dynamic physiology courses through and what are your learning objectives? How are you looking to assess it? Just so we could give feedback on what they were developing and just any holes that we see might create student confusion. Okay, so the grant's original purpose that Justin shared, I'm going to focus now on bioscience stuff, was again to develop select courses. Again, we had six that we had identified for this online hybrid delivery, delivery format and it was for select demographics. So specific courses for a specific audience, you know, working students. But now with COVID, we had to shift everything online. You know, Justin shared his anatomy physiology courses. You know, my 1010 course I originally took through, I told them this is for a specific group. You know, people have graduated. It was not gonna be for high school students that are normally, that are enrolled in high school. Uh, the Biosciences program is a college now program that we can have students and their junior and senior years in high school go through the program where they can graduate with their high school degree and an associates of applied science and bioscience at the same time. 
those students were not originally intended for this delivery format. COVID-19 said, we don't care what your plans were, you're gonna have to do it. And so the dilemma that I and Justin and every single faculty person in the country and on the planet arguably has had to deal with, how do I aid those students to be successful? And again, I instantly thought of, I'm gonna have 16 year old students that have gotten A's in high school, probably didn't have to study much. All of a sudden I have to take my 1010 course. That's pretty complex. Take our general biology course. That's got a ton of information. Whole snap. How are we gonna make sure they're successful? And this, and Justin shared this, and I have shared this with every QM review that I have done, is that I intentionally set up my bioscience courses in Canvas or whatever learning management system you have, but I deliberately design the courses with a deliberate mindset. And what I mean by that, it wasn't just, let me get all the information in there, is okay, let me get the critical information in there, but make sure students can access it. You know, look at it with that fresh set of eyes. If I'm a new student that's never been in Canvas before, can they find where the syllabus is? Can they find the best way to contact me? Can they find critical due dates? Because again, if students have to click on something 20 times to find the due date, they start to lose motivation. And I didn't want to start losing first years, you know, in the first month of the semester. So one thing that I did is I made sure that students could clearly understand where to find, you know, the course material. I utilize modules in my Canvas courses. I have pages within each module. Like I have an introductory page for each module. That's where the required reading is listed. That's where the objectives of the module are. I have assignments listed, you know, required readings. And I make sure they do the readings because I utilize some quizzes to make sure that they read the material. They're low risk, low points, but in order to basically be successful on those quizzes, they have to spend some time with the material. And then I do some other quizzes at the end of the module that are more traditional, more in depth, but the due dates for each of those quizzes, that first quiz I call the gateway quiz, that last one I call the grand module quiz, if you will, it's the same due date at the same times. So that way they can kind of get into a routine because they had work and then that became very critical when I started to have students go into quarantine, which we've all had to go with. Um, and then something I really made sure to do, and this was something kind of ingrained in my head from my days taking courses through QM when I sat on the other side of the screen, if you will, was I provided the purpose of everything I assigned to them. You know, because if I was a new student coming in and I see I have two quizzes due a week, ugh, I don't like this. But I provided the students, here's why you have two quizzes. Here's the purpose of this first quiz. Here's the purpose of the second quiz. Here's the purpose of this lab. And just really remind them. And it's things that normally I would tell students in lab, but I wanted to make sure I had the mindset to have those expectations and have those purposes up front to students, just so that it didn't come across as busy work at the end of the day. Um, now, we were notified at the college in June that our lecture components would be virtual. But as of then, labs were gonna be allowed in person. And in the middle of all these reviews for the fall term, you know, we started to share with folks, what's your COVID contingency? You know, yeah, as of right now, we would always jokingly say the date and time, we have labs in person, what's your plan if we lose those labs in October, in November? And then finally, I got that dreaded deer and headlights look of, oh crap, that applies to me too. And in the fall curriculum, I have more critical in-person lab assessments, like lab practicals, especially in that 1010 course. Like before they get into gene cloning, I wanna make sure they can hold a micropipette. I wanna make sure that they can make solutions at specific concentrations with certain pH values. You cannot replicate that with a virtual simulation. Okay, so if there's only one thing you take away from me, realize, you know, yes, I help design courses online, but I will also fully admit and QM will admit as well, there are certain things you cannot assess in an online format. You know, a classic one in the health field is you can't have a lab simulation that properly allows a student to demonstrate mastery on how to transfer a patient from the bedside to a wheelchair. 
You know, you can't just click on the person, drag them over on the screen. Is yep, they know how to do it. Not quite. Okay, so I had to plan for this. How am I going to make sure I can get these critical lab assessments done in person when I don't know how long I'm going to have them in the lab? So my solution was I rearranged my course schedule to get critical lab assessments completed as early as possible. So those critical lab practicals uh, in my second year advanced techniques course, they don't have any formal lab practicals, but they have a couple of very long two or three week lab experiments that they have a big lab report they submit. I look at the report, I look at their documentation, make sure they match. I basically act like a quality assurance auditor. Normally I have that late October, early November. I couldn't guarantee I was gonna have that. So my goal was to get these critical assessments done by early October. And so what I did for instance in 1010 was I had a normally in-person lab that I found a virtual lab. It wasn't a critical heavy lifting lab. I was able to find something online the students could do. Just because of that little change, I was able to move my first lab practical up one week, which worked out beautifully because there was a time in October we thought we may have to, we might lose labs. And the 2410 course, this was where I had to get creative. And I told folks I blew my schedule up. I literally did and rearranged the course schedule. I was able to get creative with it. I talked with our instructional designer, like, hey, am I losing my mind by going with this? I checked with our dean and I was able to move that critical lab report assessment up three weeks in the course schedule. And then just basically come back in the second half of these courses and pick up those other labs. So again, not the most ideal thing, but especially if these are assessments that I report to our advisory board that students can do, I need to be able to demonstrate that students can actually do that. So Linnea had a question. Um, some programs thought of checking out lab kits and then Zooming the students at home to assess lab competencies. What do you think? I did think about that and that was a fallback. Um, as I shared with folks during my QM review because the 2410 course was one I had to take through this modified process. Um, I was like, here's plan C that I've come up with. Plan D would be, I have enough micro pipettes. I could send, check those kits out with students, send them home and then collect them back at the end of, uh, end of the semester. So um, Deborah also has a question, what virtual simulations did you utilize? Um, in the spring, I used FET Interactive. And here in the fall, Justin's gonna share a lot of the lab simulations that we've done with his 1230 Gen Bio course. We've leaned heavily on them for that course. So good question. We'll get to that here in a little bit. Okay, now we also knew that students, as we progress through the semester, that some students will be forced into quarantine or they would test positive. And again, I, Justin's had to deal with that. We've all had to deal with that. I've had to deal with that early on. October was okay. November has been kind of crazy as all of us have been dealing with. Um, I think we're all glad Thanksgiving's coming next week because I don't know if we'd make it another month. Um, now, with this deliberate mindset, knowing, okay, I don't have a set schedule on how long I'm going to have them in the labs, and it might happen I don't see them for two weeks, which I've had happen. Again, we all have had that. We want to make sure those students that go in the quarantine, you know, as long as they're healthy and able to, like some of my students have, they had to do because they had a direct relative test positive. We want to make sure those students can still be successful, and we certainly don't want them to get lost and they feel like they have to withdraw because they got lost and because, you know, they got quarantined for two weeks, so they're automatically going to fail. Again, I was, so how did we plan for this? Is again, was one thing to keep the course in whatever learning, learning management system you have constantly up to date, trying to work ahead, you know, one, two weeks if I could, near the end of the semester, just got down to one week. But again, making sure students were clear on how, how to contact me, Again, those consistent due dates for quizzes, for me, it was on Mondays and Wednesdays. That also avoided me getting slammed with the same email from different students. When stuff do, when stuff do, I can just say, check Canvas, here it is. So it saved me a lot of time as well. And again, this was where being deliberate in that course design was a saving grace 
for my students and also just for my own sanity. And I'm sure Justin can share this too, especially with the volume of students that he has with our AMP courses. It makes it so much easier for students to know exactly where things are laid out and how we're gonna contact them if things do change. So again, you can plan ahead for this while maintaining the rigor. And that's what I tried to share with folks over the summer as they got their courses ready for the falls. Like the more work you can put in now, it's gonna save you some time in the fall when it gets all crazy, okay? Um, so Josh had a question here. My concern is how to teach our lab courses when we have zero access for an extended period of full year. Um, college administration is not allowing any access to campus. Um, virtual simulations and at home kits seem to be good supplements, but can't fully replicate the program. Josh, I immensely agree with you on that. Um, you know, I was very fortunate in the spring, especially this fall, to get those critical assessments done. Our administrations worked very closely with us. Um, but, you know, we did have another program in our building that their accrediting body was not as understanding, I guess is a polite way to say it. And so those students all had to take incompletes and they were scheduled to graduate in May. So they had to take incompletes. We were able to get those things in. Uh, I think it was in July, we were able to get those students back in the labs, get those critical assessments done so they were able to graduate. But um, that is the tricky part is, Online learning is great, and I will be the first one to tell you, it only goes so far for those in-person assessments. I absolutely agree with that. Um, so, go ahead, Justin. Um, Josh, how many students do you have in your particular program, and do you have a practicum course? Because um, there is a possibility if you have a really good working relationship with that, um, with that community partner, they might allow you to run a single assessment of how well those students do when it comes to those particular skills before they even start there um, so that they have a better idea themselves. Yeah, great questions. We have about 20 students in our cohort this year and we're not allowed to do any offsite practicums either. We do have that course in our curriculum, but we were not allowed to do it this year. So here's the next part of the question. At our college, we have a trailer. And by a trailer, I mean one that connects to a semi. Is there a way that you might have, let's say, I have a minivan, um, lab in a van um, to, to some weird extent where they could um, potentially do those particular uh, activities at a safe distance and fully uh, sterilize the environment afterwards. That's an intriguing idea. I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I have a lot of very odd ideas. So beware when you ask uh, some of the questions as, as everyone who knows me in this in this particularly uh, will go, wow. Um, <laughs> Um, the the Leah um, the trailer um, it was specifically bought for engineering and healthcare, but neither are using it effectively. And I've had multiple thoughts on how to use it. Our biggest hindrance with it is actually finding an appropriate driver, and that's mm -hmm. that's a different challenge. But it may actually be an easier challenge to uh, alleviate during this particular situation. We just haven't um, closed that gap yet because we weren't forced to. Right now, it's just wherever you're forced to close gaps right now. And so a couple other um, comments we had in the chat, and then I'll keep going. So I have one more slide, and I'll hand it back over to Justin. Um, you know, folks saying, Deborah and Sandy, they keep, you know, very similar to what I shared, you know, assignments, quizzes, do similar days. But yes, we always have those students that we could have it tattooed on every lecture video right here when things are due. And they're still not gonna be able to see it. Um, at those points, it's like, oh, okay. But by at least being, and again, you folks can share as well, by having that deliberate mindset, it's gonna hopefully decrease the frequency of those questions. So again, you know, if I have one or two students, that's okay. But for those of you that have a high volume of students, 
if 20% of your students don't see that and they're sending you emails, that's an hour a day that you need to be recording videos, you need to be providing feedback, and you're answering the same dang question pointing to the same thing. Um, there's only, oh, if we can make students actually read things, but again, somebody needs to write a grant on that. Um, and faculty. Oh, <laughs> Yes. Uh, uh, Leslie, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna reference your question directly in a slide a little later on how we did our delivery and how I specifically still do not my delivery and how I see my delivery changing forever because of how I've done it. Mm. And Charlene, uh, your comment, my school we did half of this semester virtual half on campus, found it impossible to get students to show up. They'd rather watch the experiments online. I should have made an option, but I was worried students would drop once we went online. Yeah, and that was something too um, I kept in mind. You know, I was like, okay, do I want to have two different options for students to do for each week with experiments? Um, you know, if you're uncomfortable coming on campus, do this. If you want to stay on campus, do, you know, we're going to do this. I was very hesitant on that because I don't know. Um, time-wise my own sanity but also just having students doing different things for the same learning objectives is just i could see a slippery slope going down i really wanted to avoid if at all possible but at the same time though i understand your points you got to do what you got to do um to get students um, in and out um go ahead justin um as as chair of the assessment committee i'd have a big problem with two different values of assessment for one particular learning outcome. Um, having an online version where they're not actually physically interacting versus one where they are, um, it doesn't necessarily meet the same outcome or do the same thing. Um, and so that, I, I think accrediting bodies would also have a problem with it. I know that we don't have that that big uh, thing as, as much in this particular group, but um, I, I know that would be a problem. Mm. And so the last comments I'll share, and then I will zip my lip and let Justin take back over, is for now, and I'll do my joke that I always do, on November 20th at 3.49 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, the plan for our spring semester is the same as the fall online hybrids where the labs will be in person. But as of right now, we have multiple considerations. Um, we had some discussions yesterday with the college as a whole um, our semester is scheduled to start January 11th. Um, we might push that back a week and have everything in person, or we may keep that time and start virtually. Um, we might get rid of our spring break. Again, these are all um, scenarios I'm sure all of you folks at your colleges and universities have had discussions with. It's just part of the COVID craziness, trying to get through this week while planning for the next week and planning for the next semester. Um, things I have purposely considered, and I'm really tempted to pull the trigger on is transitioning all of my January labs to virtual learning and just start now. Um, I could do it for my genetics course pretty easy because we're looking at laws of probability. There's things I could do with students in Zoom pretty straightforward in those labs. My pharmacology toxicology course in that first month we you know analyze over the counter drugs with chromatography. That one's a little tricky to do online. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet. You know, utilizing guest speakers, especially for my practicum course, again, my advisory board. I'm very fortunate. I have a very active advisory board wanting to um, participate in that. You know, utilizing case studies even more. Um, I know Linnea talked a good bit when we've talked with her over these last few months. She leaned heavily on case studies. And I'm sure we all have done that. Um, and then student placement for their external practicum course. You know, what happens because most of my students, again, want to go to Charles River. What if Charles River says no? So I'm actually sending that email today and getting with our head HR person. So again, these are all questions that I have thinking and I'm sure we all have multiple things that we're just kind of floating around trying to figure out what is, um, what is the plan for the spring. So before I hand it over to Justin, I see some other um, comments. Leslie, our county public health officials said we have to allow per students to not attend in person. Um, I understand that one. Um, if 
Biointeractive has great resources. Again, Justin is going to share some great ones. Innovate Bio also has some great ones as well. Shameless plug for our lovely Innovate Bio folks. Um, I'm going to be using some of their bioinformatics stuff in my genetics course. Um, and then Deborah asked a great question, and I was going to hit this on the very last <laughs> one. Um, can you reorganize the order of labs, some to put more virtually friendly labs early? Absolutely. It's basically the reverse of the fall. That's where, like, in my genetics course, I may do, I'd always looked at doing more bioinformatics stuff. Sandy Porter, I'll be getting with you. Um, and our colleagues with the DNA subway. Yes. Um, that's, I'm looking to, I've always wanted to add more bioinformatics. This is a great little nudge to make me do that. So I've absolutely looked at doing that with, especially my genetics course, with my second year students. Absolutely. That's a great way to kind of think of it. And then just kind of flip flop. Again, as long as you are comfortable with the sequencing of your course, of your learning objectives, because again, you want to make sure they have, um, you know, the foundational material down before you get to that advanced stuff. So I always want to make sure everything, your sequencing of a course is where you want it. Um, and Sandra's saying about our bioinformatics course in Canvas Commons, thank you so much. I'm going to play with that over the break. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute myself and let Justin take it back over and get into the fun parts. I purposely wanted him to go last to just show all the hands-on lab stuff he's had students do over um, over the last few months. Um, so some of these things are, are activities that I used to do in person and now have found ways of, of doing virtually with the students. But some of them were just, hey, I need an idea or, hey, I need a lab. How am I going to do this? Um, and taking things, you know, fall back on your experience and find ways to make that experience work with with home um so solutions at home to being at home uh, i actually moved up the title here I'm, i i think i moved up the slide um i believe it was leslie earlier uh on demand and on demand and this is who i am now on demand uh i've set up different simulations using household items um crafting uh, i'm a big crafty person. Um, I, I paint, I sculpt. Um, I very much am, am into all that stuff. So um, crafting these different situations, uh, craft your way out of a situation, right? Um, study materials, flow charts, um, you can make those interactive materials instead of just, this is how I'm writing my notes, uh, making them something that the students can actually physically interact with and use. Um, send them stuff. Um, and a lot of that is our plan for next semester too, um, but getting materials to them. Um, and I'll focus more on the general biology for majors course than the anatomy physiology course. Um, have a good one, uh, Charlene. Um, I, I can't, uh, it's, the text is really small. Um, and computer simulations. So there we go. I forgot I didn't have control, Jason. Embarrassing. Uh, so on demand and on demand. Why in the world would I say it that way? Well, um, I provide all of my lectures ahead of time. They are all pre-recorded. They're all recorded into small chunks. So five, 10 minutes, that's the max I try to do. Um, occasionally I'll have a situation where I drone on a little bit. Surprise, surprise to anyone who knows me. Uh, but the 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 intended maximum is 10 minutes. Uh, and I rarely go over that. So students have access to all the materials at the beginning of the module. They can look through and they can go through all of those lectures ahead of time. I also have um, old school practice. Of, <laughs> sorry, uh, old school practice of fill in notes. So where the students are constantly adding to their note packet as they go. So they can't just turn it on, go to sleep. They have to turn it on and stay with it. Now, I don't grade those note packets, but you know pretty quickly when people are using them. So I am on demand at any time, whether it's 1 a.m. or 1 p.m., student can access me from that lecture standpoint. When it comes to testing, I am also on demand. So 
we still have course times for all of our courses. And when you sign up, you must have that course time free. Now, in our general biology, or I'm sorry, our biology one course, or generally general biology four majors course, uh, I have set Zoom meetings so that I can keep the students up to date on what's going on, make sure that they can ask questions. And I, I particularly target the most difficult un concepts to understand in that particular chapter or module um, to, to discuss with them. But the main reason that I maintain the time is testing. When the test is on, it is this time and no other. And the reason for that is I am on demand. I am online. I am with you while you do this. When you are meeting this challenge, I am there with you. So when you have another challenge, whether it's your internet goes out because there's a windstorm, wink, wink, somebody else here, uh, or, um, or, or your computer shuts down, or you don't listen to us and you use Safari instead of a functional browser when it comes to Canvas. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put this one out there for everybody, okay? If you have a student who says, my test disappeared, I took this test, but it's not there. Ask them what browser they use. I'm gonna guarantee you they're gonna say Safari. It eats exams and I don't know how and I don't know why. Um, so when the students are taking the test, I am there. So I am on demand to support them and help them with whatever problems they have. Picture doesn't load, um, they can't get it to advance, something's wrong, their internet goes out, um, they have a family emergency, whatever. I am on demand. So in this new on-demand culture, I'm on demand and I'm on demand. Um, So um, students doing uh, presentations over on the labs. Um, I absolutely do like that idea um, on what the labs were doing or what they were trying to accomplish and then using those um, to kind of jigsaw back to the main overall idea. Um, it's not necessarily the style that I am accustomed to. And we've all had to branch out in this um, and, and go in different directions. Um, but keeping an idea of where your strengths are. Um, I absolutely see that, you know, Linnea is very good at um, interacting with many different people from many different directions. Um, I kind of, when it comes to my, my teaching, it's centralized from me and then out. So I've, I've planned that way uh, to play more to my strengths, but I think that's a great direction and a great strength. Um, and absolutely, Deb, um, that stuff, it doesn't show up. It doesn't show up because it doesn't work because it doesn't even support JPEG files anymore. Mm. Um, there, there is a trick with that, Deborah. Um, if you have them right click and open it in a new window, it will most often show up. Most often, I will not say always. <laughs> Sorry, Lene, you wanted to, uh, you wanted to make a point. Yeah, just play to your strengths. When when the chips are down, play to your strengths. Um, know know who you are, know how you teach, and and make it work from where you are. Um, if there's anything you take away from us, it's play to your strengths. Don't try and be somebody you're not. Um, who? Yeah, Chrome or Firefox. You have to get them to download it because it's a nightmare. Okay. Um. Using household items. Um, I had students, and you'd think that I'd be able to find it when I'm talking about it, but um, using household items to act as cellular machinery. Mm. So a, scissor, a pair of scissors only does one thing, right? It only cuts. Um, in that, we went through and we took a piece of paper and we modified it in order to show one step at a time, one piece at a time. That's how these enzymes work. But I also used, um, I don't have the rubber band with me, I guess it broke, but I used a rubber band to show competitive and non-competitive inhibition, um, whether it prevented the scissors from interacting with the paper or it prevented the handle from being able to operate, right? Competitive, non-competitive, right? And so ask questions about those. So 
all the students should have roughly the same end product. So you can take, have them take pictures, submit those and see whether they got where they needed to get. Uh, but also ask questions throughout the lab and have those turned in as well. Um, and I've got write-ups on that if you have an interest. Um, go backwards. So one thing that happens is um, paper simulations. Long ago, not that long to me, but um, long ago, 97, uh, there's a paper in American Physiology, Physiological Society. Uh, and it was called the endocrine rat. I've used this in multiple places because we don't have access to actual laboratory animals for, for performing these experiments. So it's a great experiment to show the effects of specific endocrine hormones. Uh, if you'd like that paper, I can send you a copy of it or it's pretty easy to find um, because, you know, um, American Physiology Society is a, a pretty big society. Uh, but the, the idea is that the students are investigating an accident in the lab where the rats were uh, injected with the wrong hormones. So they have a control set that has not been injected and then the, uh, the rats that show the variance or difference. Um, so that's really good because it makes the students have to really understand what's happening with the physiology, um, what's happening with these uh, hormones um, and what effects they would have if they were gained or lost. Um, and Jason had used it as well at one point when he needed it um, in, in farm talks, um, as he says. Uh, yeah, we, we, I, I certainly fell back on it last semester, um, or yeah, last semester because we talk about the endocrine system, we investigate the endocrine system, but we investigate the wet lab where we're dissecting something. So here we had to go a bit different. Um, crafting, as I said, I make stuff, right? And here I make stuff. Um, one of the classic ones that I do, and I used to have students do this in person, is an antibody antigen lab. Um, and that's for teaching the general ABO blood type and then the RH, um, the rhesus factor. So the students are asked to, and very simply, very carefully, and very um, in a very detailed fashion, what items, what cuts they need to make at what point in time. Um, now there's creativity involved, so they love that. Um, but depending upon the course level, you can use it at different difficulties, right? You can have just the basics of ABO, you can have uh, RH involved, or you can actually have it act as a blood typing well, shouldn't have put it this far down, uh, where you, you have a box and the box is, is set. You have the letter on the box so they know which antibody goes in which well, which is generally what, what students lose, is that antibody A is in the A well. So if it agglutinates, it's got A, right? Uh, and so on and so forth. So um, they can keep these materials to practice with later. And that, again, is, is going to be on the next slide. But that is the biggest asset of all of these pieces. These are effectively notes, but they're notes that they use. Um, where those writing notes are notes that you use, these are notes where, and, and an example is the citric acid cycle, which it's hard to get a good picture of. Um, or even something so simple as mitosis. Um, I often complain to my students, um, I'll say it that way, um, complain to my students, note cards are bad. Um, they are a crutch. You have an answer on one side and a name on another. You don't learn anything, you just look at them. When instead, you have a sequence of cards talking about a physiological process with the numbers on the back and you have to shuffle them up and put them back in order. Now you're learning something. Now there's a challenge. Um, and the joke I make is no strength without adversity, no strength without a challenge. Um, so having things, simple things like, like mitosis, but also complex things like the citric acid cycle and which stage is the molecule in uh, can be great study resources for this 
initial majors biology course, but it teaches them how to study for those advanced courses later on, both throughout their AS degree, their BS degree, graduate degree, on and on, and how maybe they teach their kids, maybe, maybe how they teach their community. So understanding that viewing things in just one way and sitting there and looking at the book isn't the way to do it. This active learning is a key piece. Um, oh, I like the socks thing. I like that a lot. Um, whether they're homologous or um, whether there's homologous chromosomes, whether they're sister chromatid, I like that. I'm stealing that. I'm sorry. I'm totally stealing that. Uh, you totally I, should. I always tell people to use laundry and, and you know, to take similar things like you've got holiday socks. Those are homologous pairs versus other things. I've often done it in demo. My problem with it, and, and I did put this in the chat, is that like I'm, I'm stealing your ABO blood type thing. That's awesome. But I can't get the students to do it. They only get points if they take pictures of it. And you know if it's theirs or it's not theirs. And they can't okay. copy them. So the points are associated with them using something to mm -hmm. take, take a picture and submitting that in Canvas. So the activity, they don't get points for it unless they do it. Um, so I have specific drop boxes for each of those. OK, yeah, that's good. I, I literally had students say, I don't have access to a kitchen. I can't get salt. I can't. I mean, I don't know. Are they lying? But maybe it's true. I, I hope it's not true, but unfortunately, it very well could be. In Oakland? Yeah. So I found that I couldn't. I about that too, Leslie. I, I couldn't I force them. Yeah. So it was only, I could only suggest because so, I didn't want to, I don't know. Am I being too flexible? I don't know. I, no. Ah. I, think, I think the statement is from an equity standpoint, what you, what, and, and it's hard to believe that they have internet access, but no kitchen, but that, you know, I, I do get that. Um, but <laughs> it, it's certainly possible. Absolutely. Um, from an equity standpoint, you can choose to exclude assignments. It's, it's called EX. You can type that in in Canvas and it can take it out of the overall grade. Now, I don't suggest doing that many times, but if they have proof of a situation where they are unable to complete a lab for that reason, Absolutely. I think, I think that's a fair, equitable practice. And if anyone in your college were to ask, honestly, personally, this is how I work. I would go tell my dean before I did it. I'd go talk to my dean and say, this is, I'm, I'm looking at this as an equitable practice uh, that I'm going to do with this particular student because of their issue. Um, do you feel that that's, that that's appropriate? If your dean says no, um, I'd personally be probably pretty shocked, but he, I'm, I certainly believe it's possible, um, but for the number of points that I associate with it, out of a thousand point course, this citric acid cycle uh, thing is five to 10, depending upon how it is. So, um, you know, it's, it's, never, it's never over, overly heavily points when it comes to the artistic items. And the reason for that is students will be obsessive compulsive about it. They, they will, they will worry and worry and worry that it's not going to get them the points because it's not perfect. And no matter how many times I tell them, I just want you to show me you know it. The only goal, the only thing, all assessments are only designed to show me what you know. I don't give you a grade ever. You get what grade you have displayed. Um, if a student is unable to show you via that, that technique, I think it's appropriate to exclude it. Does that make sense? We've kind of gotten the Justin ramble. Um, sorry. Um, and and I, I love the dollar store. In fact, I actually um, tell my students to go to the dollar store and pick up many of their items before we get started in a course. Uh, Here's a list of what you need, construction papers, scissors, stuff like that. And the idea is that they probably already have it at home, but if they don't, they can get it ahead of time. Um, go ahead, Jason. Yeah, and if I could just interject on top of that, I know um, I heard of some other colleges doing this because originally we were going to have our biology 1230 labs on campus because like all my bioscience ones are here. <laughs> no, 1230 was going to be on campus. <laughs> 
we were, as Justin's laughing, um, he, he does a lecture portion. I've done the labs for this course. We had plexiglass in the lab. We have plexiglass in our anatomy physiology labs. There's been no issues with those really. In my lab, for some reason, we tried to hang them from the ceiling. I get a call from facilities that two or just or somebody, two or three fell in the lab was before the semester started. So we couldn't use plexiglass in my lab, which is where we normally do this 1230 lab. And we couldn't socially distance students without those plexiglass, without having to make like another two or three lab sections. So we, we were already kind of leaning towards, and the first of August, Justin and I made the call, but specifically Justin as the course coordinator, to take the labs online. All of this happened like the week before classes. So we would have had to scramble a week before until students labs virtual labs virtual. But I say all that to say, I think we did this here. I know other places have done this. When they made that transition and they knew they weren't gonna use all those lab fees, they purposely refunded those you know, portions to students and say, told them use this to buy those home lab supplies. Because again, we can't assume the ESCs are dollar store items, which is fantastic. But, you know, with COVID-19, again, I had students losing jobs back in the spring. Um, you know, I can't assume that they can just go spend $20 at Target to get this stuff. So a lot of places have done that, which is fantastic. Just kind of refund those lab fees, but told students, please use this to go get the construction paper or a pair of scissors if you don't have them. Le Leslie, when you say you're not allowed to charge them lab fees, do you mean in an online environment or do you mean whatsoever? Whatsoever. That's insane. How do you, how do you buy anything? We are given very small budgets um, and which come out of lottery funds in California, which was initially planned not to supplant, um, but to supplement, but um, completely supplants. So that's how we have our consumables. Um, so yeah, it's it's very exciting um, because we're not we're not allowed to charge any lab fees. So we we've given some budget of consumables, um, and so we that, we work very hard to reuse a lot of things or use models um, and and do some other things. Or with our bioman and biotech because we have so much grant funding, strong workforce funds has enabled us to really put that in towards supplies. Um, though again, technically you're not so supposed to supplant, um, but we've been able to, to develop some things like that. But yeah, it, it, it makes it a bit more challenging. So um, luckily at our, at our college, um, I think they have the appropriate business practice of lab fees can only go to the lab. They can only go to our lab and if we're charging more lab fees than we are actually using um there are questions um why are you doing that so um wow um normally i would not say nice things about our uh our business department but um i guess i'm saying nice things about our business department wow um cool that that makes me pretty happy uh i'm sorry to hear that josh um yeah, so, well, this next part um, poses the, uh, a little bit of a challenge as well. Um, send them materials or have them do materials. Um, DNA extraction is a classic lab that, um, you know, you can you can have a, a grade school kid do. And in fact, that's one of the labs that I do in uh, when we when we go to the Mansfield Children's Festival, um, where uh, kids from, you know, newborns all the way up to 12, 14 year olds, uh, go down the, the main street in Mansfield um, and visit different booths that are all for um, different, different activities for kids. Um, and because of the grant, we were able to have a booth there. Um, but this DNA extraction lab is that classic one you're thinking of when you, I always use an onion, some people use strawberries. Remember, strawberries are one of those allergens. So that's why I, I suggest onions. Um, but where they, they remove the DNA, I do, I have talked to some individuals from another college who have an at-home gel electrophoresis lab. I do not have uh, necessarily access to send that around. Um, um, we're gonna send out fetal pigs um, along with some other um, organisms for dissection in biology uh, 1231, which is uh, biology two for majors which is, you know, my 
favorite course because I am actually an evolutionary biologist, a functional morphologist, right? Uh, and we'll have a lot of ecology activities that we'll talk about in, I think, the next slide. But um, boy, it seems like this one would be the most limiting one for our audience. So I'll move to the next one. <laughs> so um, ecology labs, um, the beauty part of ecology labs, right? You can, you can have students, and especially here in Ohio, I understand there might be challenges in some other states right now. Uh, but you know, our ecology labs are toward the end of the semester anyway. Now, this is another situation where I am going to reshuffle labs, just as Jason has done, because our um, plant anatomy and plant uh, evolution uh, discussions are normally during our second module. Um, they're basically four modules that I like to go through or how I like how I used to like to schedule it all. I'm going to shift those to the end and do plant biology and ecology together uh, because I'm going to have them go outside find some, some different organisms, as, as I had them do, measure trees, um, do some plots, and pick up some flowers, pick up some leaves, to then go back inside using the scalpels and wonderful tools they got when it came to their fetal pig. They're going to use those to dissect the flower. Uh, so they're going to have a two-part lab. It'll count for two labs. I'll ask a little more time. Uh, but to provide them those materials without having to spend a whole lot of extra money getting them frozen flowers to try and send off to them that you know will fail and wilt and not work out. So rather than deal with that, I went a different route. Um, another old school lab that I had to employ was um, a nutrition lab, right? Um, a calorie intake, calorie use. Now, some students would go, well, well, I have one of these wristbands. It does it for me. I don't need to do this. Um, Absolutely, you do. You need to check what that wristband's doing, right? The wristband, it can be your control if you want, uh, but you need to know what it is in comparison. Um, so we went through and, and did that classic lab of what were you doing? How long were you doing it? What were you eating? How long, how much of it did you eat? Um, what were your calories in, calories out? Um, and that's always a good one um, in, in general biology courses. Oh, the protein cheer. I almost forgot I put this in. So this is an activity, and there are many of these, um, so many of these that I do in both uh, general biology and anatomy and physiology. This is just one of them. This is one of my classics. Um, so if you have your video on, I'm going to have you do it. And if you don't have your video on, you should still do it. Are you ready? Here, turn your video on, OK? So when it comes to how proteins are, are finished, right? all those different structures they have to go through. That primary structure are the amino acids all in a line, right? One, two, three, four, five, 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 five. So what I want you to do is like you're playing the keys on a keyboard or on a piano, you go, da -da 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 -da. this is my primary structure, da -da 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 -da. primary structure. Okay, so the primary structure can turn into either an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. Well, we're not gonna do a beta pleated sheet. We're gonna do an alpha helix. So we're gonna have our hand go twist. So that's our secondary structure. So we had our primary and secondary. And it's actually pretty important that your arm is straight out right now. And the reason that's important is when we have this tertiary structure, that fold could right, be the end of a protein, or we could go to a quaternary structure. right? So we had primary, secondary, tertiary. Then we go through and we have another primary, secondary, tertiary, and they meet, and now we have a quaternary structure, and it's Pac-Man. And Pac-Man does something, right? What does Pac-Man do? I don't know. Pac-Man doesn't know what Pac-Man does, but Pac-Man does something, and this protein does something. See? So you can have the students do those things. I, I have those for, oh my goodness, when it, motion, um, ventricles of the brain. Um, I, I call it my interpretive dance of the ventricles of the brain. Uh, they, they usually laugh at me a lot um, because by the end of it, I look like I'm going to fall over. Um, I physically go through in class and run around showing um, how skeletal muscle contracts um, with actin and myosin um, and cross um, and making cross bridges. Um, I sit in a chair, right? And when I sit in a chair, I have made the cross bridge. What would it take for me to get up? energy, right? ATP, 
right? So it's an old trick, but that's a bit longer one that I can't really do inside my house all that well. Uh, so anytime you can get students to physically do it, they have a better chance of remembering it because it's multiple different ways. Um, simulations. Uh, yeah, we're running out of time, so I do have to speed up. I'm sorry. Uh, simulation. So Symbio is, is our go-to when it comes to simulations. Um, it's six bucks a student, a module. So that's pretty nice. They just came up with a translation transcription one um, that we ended up... Um, Really, thank you. Um, that uh, we 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 um, beta tested, and I have to send feedback about the beta test. Uh, but um, there are a huge number of labs on here now. We went pretty heavy with them in this first course because we thought there might be some things we could do in person, and then uh, you know all the plexiglass fell down and shattered, uh, and so it, uh, we we ended up going a little more heavy. Uh, but this next semester where it's ecology and evolution, again, play to your strengths. You know, ecology and evolution, that's, that's a big strength for me. Um, and dissection and at-home dissection are things that I can have the students do. So um, we'll only probably use uh, three or four labs, but they're all very good ones, like a, a Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium lab that I really like. Because um, that's always a nightmare. Um, I'll keep moving through so we've got at least some time. Um, th this is this is Jason's, here we go. And so this is the last slide that we have. We've timed this almost perfectly, Justin, I'm proud of us. Um, and again, I'll just share this and then I'll zip my lip and give you folks some time to share innovative things that you've done. Um, these are things when I've gone through the courses again as from the outside perspective coming in, um, for courses within my division. And actually within the last three weeks, I've had to step in and also review courses for another division due to a faculty situation. So I always tried to share this with folks and this is just my parting advice, but also these are things that Justin have shared, you know, you folks have shared as well is, you know, consider course material that you can shift or outsource to distance learning. If you're needing like say for this fall, like crap, I normally do this very critical in-person assessment in November, but I'm not sure if I'm gonna have them in November. If you can shift stuff online, you can move things up. Same thing as Deborah said, you can do the reverse of that. You know, uh, am I gonna have my bioscience students in my lab in January? Probably not, but could I have them in March? Hopefully, so I can kind of rearrange things. Again, this is where that creativity as Justin has shared so very well these last few minutes where that comes into play. Um, again, being deliberate and providing your expectations to students, especially if it's a particular assignment, um, try to provide as much consistency as well. And also as Justin shared, and this takes a lot more time, but I, I will purposely take a minute and talk about this, then I'm gonna stop sharing screen and we'll just let everybody chat for a second. If you do record your lectures, try to keep them short and sweet as Justin kind of dived into with that. It's that on-demand presence allows you to have that instructor presence, but also, you know, as instructors, we're having to go through all this insanity with COVID-19. If you do these mini lecture videos, when something gets updated, like I just did one a few weeks ago for immunotherapy, for instance, in our 1010 course, well, that's changing pretty rapidly. So next year, if I have students in person, guess what? I now have a huge resource collection of many lecture videos I can provide to students. I can supplement the additional in-person lecturing. Hopefully we have them in the fall, but hey, I've got these resources here. I might, might as well leverage them to get the most bang for my buck. And so then that way too, if you do need to change something, you don't have to try and change something in the middle of a two hour video. You can just change that little mini lecture video and just swap in a new one. Um, and again, also provides the a la carte option that if they're really struggling, let's say with the citric acid cycle, here's a 10 minute concise video on the citric acid cycle that's not in the middle of a like two and a half hour Zoom video. Because that's where you're gonna, students are gonna be like, I gotta remember the timestamp, I forget it. I'll just hope for the best. That's one thing you wanna try to eliminate at any point in anything with any courses. So with that being said, no more PowerPoint, more people's faces. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna share a screen for one second because we did forget one very, very 
like simple thing and i don't know why we did but oh yeah <laughs> we never put our contact info up <laughs> so, i'm sorry um hit print screen um yeah we uh yeah I, I realized that as i got to the end i went oh no we never did that um it's really easy to mess up our emails because we're both jt and in fact our science department actually has another fellow whose initials are jt so um it's a nightmare sometimes um but it's it's first letter and then last name at nc.state.college.edu um I will stop share now. So if you need to, and this is another thing that I do with my students, um, even in person in our labs, when I draw on the board, I say, I'm about to stop or I'm about to delete it because I have a, a digital board. I tell them, take a picture if you want it. So take a picture, stopping in three, two, one. Uh, now, uh, Leah, um, translated lab practicals into the online format. Um, that's specifically something that we've had to do in anatomy and physiology. And one thing that we did, um, we had a guide set of pictures for students to practice with at home after they did the in-person labs. So we went harder with that. And so we'll use images in Canvas and have it be fill-in essay questions that are timed. Um, now, I do let them go back and forth because I do feel like that, you know, is you sometimes would give them five minutes to go backwards so i won't lock them out um i am starting to take multiple pictures where it has um slightly different angles um so that if they had a different angle when they were looking at it they see some level of consistency because that's always a challenge the picture and the thing don't look the same and it's a hundred percent right um what about but using it's the like best models. that i can do did you go ahead and use models so um, it's pictures of those models that they had used um the other part that i uh were starting to use is we just obtained an anatomash table um and i'm starting to use the 3d images from that and translating through which actually plays quite well with um, my my graduate work which was all in developing 3d anatomy but that's a whole different beast right um trying to answer all the questions I can. Okay, survey link. Yeah, so I'll just jump in. I think this webinar has provided a ton of information and resources. Thank you so much to um, Justin and Jason for your presentation today. This has been recorded and will get posted on um, the Innovate Bio website. So if you, miss something or you have colleagues that you think would benefit, um, you'll be able to access it probably um, next week. So, um, you know, we're, we are at time, so we wanna, you know, let anyone go that, that needs to go. Um, and, you know, I put the link for the survey in the chat. So please do take that. It helps us, you know, improve for future webinars. And we really appreciate you all taking the time to be here. Um, and I, I'm a ranty person. I'm willing to stay on for a couple more minutes if anybody has any specific questions, but I, I figure you'll probably want to uh, stop recording, right? Yes, we will formally okay. end the webinar now. Um, and then if anyone wants to just hang out for a few minutes, you're welcome to do so.